Moderator, can we be heard? Yeah. Mr. Villa, over to you. Okay. So good evening and good morning to all the investors who joined us today. I hope that you and your families are well and safe. On behalf of the Aditya Birla Group, I would like to thank you for joining uh, this Nalco Invest today. We are connecting, as we know, at a time of steadily increasing global optimism that's been powered by a combination of rapid vaccinations and improving economic parameters. These give us cautious reason to hope that we are now firmly on the path to normalcy. Domestic community, all of you, of course, have been prescient in betting on a sharp rebound in economic right. activity. Can you just uh, hold on, Mr. Bill? I think the sound yeah. is not coming through. Let's just fix it again. Sorry, operator? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we just check that one moment. Yeah, we, we cannot hear uh, Mr. Billa. So can you please uh, fix it? Just one second, Mr. Bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we can hear yeah. him now. Yeah, we, we were able to hear him. Okay. Could you all hear Dave before me? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Villa, go ahead. I was saying we are connecting at a time of steadily increasing global optimism that's been powered by a combination of rapid vaccinations and improved economic parameters. These give us cautious reason to hope that we are now seeming to be firmly on the path to normalcy. The investor community, all of you, of course, have been prescient in betting on a sharp rebound in economic activity. As a business group, we have always believed that we are trustees of our businesses and it is our role to generate significant shareholder returns and stakeholder value. We actively engage with our stakeholders and have robust, robust mechanisms to seek and incorporate their feedback. While our companies have been doing a fine job at this, I thought it might be interesting for me to get an outside in perspective on our businesses and get a sense from our investors on what we are doing well and where we can do better. Towards this, I recently met with a wide spectrum of investors over the last few months. The experience, I would say, has been both enriching and energizing. One insight that cl clearly emerged is the scope for us to engage even more meaningfully in order to help our investors understand our business models and our levers for value creation even better. This investor day has been conceived to achieve exactly that. Indalco, as you know, has grown from being India's largest and lead leading non-ferrous metals company to becoming a world global leader. Over the last decade, as Satish mentioned in his presentation, Indalco has transformed itself from a company that was heavily dependent on the volatility of the LME to one that is a portfolio of stable and value added earnings. It has consistently delivered to its stated commitment of size, scale, operational ex excellence and profitable growth. This journey has been punctuated by some bold bets and many patient investments. Novelis, which was acquired more than a year ago, more than a decade ago was one such bet. It was viewed with skepticism by many in the I mean, in community then, but has today, as you saw in Steve's presentation, emphatically established itself as one of the best large acquisitions overseas by any Indian corporate. Alaris, which was recently acquired by Novelis, is integrating well and in just a few quarters has surprised us positively, both on synergies and operations. Much before ESG became the new buzzword, Indalco and Novellis embraced good corporate citizenship and made deep commitments and investments in driving this critical agenda. I want to reiterate what uh, uh, Sati shared with you that Indalco has been ranked as the most sustainable aluminum company globally in the corporate sustainability assessment rankings by the Dow Jones Sustainability index and Hindalco is the only Indian company to be recognized as an industry leader. And Novelis on its part is a world leader in sustainability with exemplary conditions of being the world's largest recycler. In fact, good corporate citizenship 
has been a key pillar of our leadership and business philosophy. And this is something that we have reinforced with our actions across the 10 countries in which Indalco and Novalis operate. Despite a well-proven track record, a world-class management team, and consistent operating performance over a long period of time, Indalco's market cap does not reflect the inherent strength of the business and the quality of the strategic pillars that form its foundation. This investor interaction is, as you have heard, a comprehensive response to all of your inputs, questions, and feedback. The leadership has taken you through a broad sweep of issues from explaining the purpose of the company to articulating the strategic pillars of value creation to sharing deeper insights on Novelis's business model to help you understand the conscious ESG choices the company is making. The team has also articulated for the very first time the company's capital allocation strategy as also the dividend distribution policy. Before I hand back to Satish for the Q&A, I would like to confirm, reaffirm my own commitment, that of the company and that of the group to creating long-term shareholder value. I'm sure that you will find this interaction insightful and I look forward to more conversations and even more meaningful outcomes. Thank you once again to, for joining the Hindalco Invest today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dilla. Um... And I think that uh, we will now go over to the uh, Q&A session. Um, so operator, can we switch over to the Q&A mode and start the uh, Q&A, please? Thank you very much. Instruction to all the viewers, the presentation copy has now been uploaded for your reference on the website of Hindalco and Stock Exchange. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question via PC audio, please click on the video question button Enter your name and click on the Q&A tab. If you wish to display your webcam, please use on submit request. If you wish to proceed with audio only question, please disable request slider and submit your request. Your name will be announced and you are promoted in the question queue. Please accept the prompt on your screen and proceed with the question. If you experience any technical difficulty while using PC audio, Please use audio question button and follow the instructions provided to connect via telephone line and enter star 1 to join the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the queue assembles. The first question is on the line of Pinakin Parik from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much uh, and good evening to all. Uh, this is extremely helpful. Uh, the company has laid out such a framework. Uh, I have three questions to start with. Uh, my first question is that uh, the company highlighted uh, cap, uh, organic cash flows of $1 to $1.2 billion. Uh, can we know what are the underlying assumptions in terms of LME price, novelist, uh, EBITDA per ton, and the maintenance capex? So, Praveen, over to you. Yeah, so uh, this is based on, you see, uh, LME assumption doesn't really matter for most part of our uh, uh, business forecasts, as most of, including novelists, is something that is really not connected to the LME movements. But yes, this is, uh, generally speaking, we look at the past few years, we look at the projection, and based on that, we really forecast our uh, predictions. Uh, we have good understanding of our markets as well. And that's how, that's how we really work on it. But if there's any specific question you want to ask, we can answer. So Pinakin, the, the one, uh, the mm -hmm. LME part, uh, you know, we have taken the current projections and not really taken a much higher LME. And the EBITDA per ton on the Novellis side, we stick to our original guidance of 475 to 500. So that is the, uh, the, the second point I can give you to come to that one to one point uh, to uh, and sir, what will be the maintenance capex in this? So the maintenance capex that's built in is 300 uh, million for Novellis and 250 million for Indalco India, on an average for the next five years. Uh, understood. Uh, so my second question is uh, that in, uh, in terms of uh, you know tying. 
in the one to 1.2 billion is after maintenance capex huh? i just wanted to make sure you understood, understood. yes understood uh, and sir just to clarify uh, at this point of time in the december quarter uh, would it be fair to say that the company is running ahead of these numbers <laughs> yes it would be fair to say that but you know we are giving a five year outlook pinakin and hence you know uh, to take the point we have tried to stay you know conservative uh, because you know cycles can come up and down so we are saying 1 to 1.2 billion but you're right at the end of q3 they, we are running ahead of that uh, understood uh, so my next two questions are that in terms of the uh, revision of the cash flows uh, uh, roughly 8 to 10% is towards shareholder re returns and roughly 10 to 12% seems to be towards treasury uh, now what would it take for the shareholder return to increase from 8 to 10% in terms of the operating cash flow i uh, pravin you want to take this yeah, yeah. So as you know, we have written that it's a percentage of the uh, cash flow as we have defined a discretionary free cash flow, which can be put to either deleveraging, put to growth capex, and put to the shareholder return. Now, this is you should take this as more directional and as a percentage of the overall cash flow. Uh, it is obvious that the cash flow is going to increase once the uh, investment in growth capex happens. That will add to the overall profitability and cash flow this will not remain static but we are trying to give an overall direction in terms of percentages so as the basic number increases the absolute amount yeah. of returns will also increase uh, thank you sir and so my last question is uh, uh, at this point of time would the management want to lay out an roe roadmap as well in terms of over the next five years as the cyclical element of earnings reduces uh, and the steadier annuity business stream of novelis keeps on increasing uh, should we expect a large roe expansion as well uh, yeah so yes uh, uh, there will be an expansion uh, we would not like to lay down exact numbers here at the moment because there are various projects as you've seen in the pipeline in novelis as well as in the indian various business segments each one of them has a certain uh, return on capital which will add to the for the company as a whole it all depends on how quickly we can execute how far we can go and how the business cycles also turn but our our confidence is that this will definitely help and this is different from upstream investments largely where upstream investments take a lot of time and a lot of effort a lot of capex which actually subdues the uh, roe for a short uh, period of time or medium period of time but these projects are modular first of all uh, as you've seen the, these are not very large investments per se per per, uh, per module of investment and then these are additional these are incremental so they they leverage on the existing strengths and the existing infrastructure so sure there will definitely be an expansion of the ROE going forward. Understood. This is very helpful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anut Singla of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, everyone, and uh, good morning to Steve and Dev. Uh, thank you very much for the detailed presentation and outlining the your uh, strategy focused on uh, downstream and ESG. I mean, this is the most extensive uh, presentation we have seen from you in recent times on ESG. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. My question is first on the downstream expansions in India. Uh, you talked about 900 kT of uh, you know uh, target in India. Uh, my question is, what role can Novellis play in that expansion uh, in India? Now, uh, we have seen uh, you have done a lot of work already, um, but going further, what kind of collaboration we can see from Novelli side? Yeah, I think that, Anuj, that's a, a very good question. And if you see the expansion that we first did in what we call the phase one in Hirakud, and today Hirakud is now nearly producing 135 kT, the amount of uh, technical support that we received from Novellis over these last three years has actually enabled us to bring the product quality and consistency up to that point. I'll also share with you that with Novelis's support, the first can body stock is going out of the Hirakut plant in March, going to customers in India. So for us, this uh, 
the, the second phase, which is the 300 to 600, which is largely going to happen in Hiraku, is very much dependent on that technical synergy with Novellis. And I think that with their expertise on rolling mills, on the rolling process, we are going to be able to do this expansion, which is quite uh, people process quality uh, dependent. So I think that you know the, the other part of the differentiator for Hindalco is having that novelist expertise when we do this downstream ex uh, expansion. Okay, thank you very much, sir. The second part is a uh, what uh, uh, what kind of collaboration on recycling can we see? So novelist has um, you're obviously the biggest recycler. Yes. Uh, we have seen your competitors on the steel side starting a pilot on recycling in northern part of India. Uh, how do we see that shape up for us in India? So another very good point, uh, Anuj, we are already in deep discussions with the Novellis experts. In fact, uh, down to the point of what technology and what furnaces need to be uh, bought. But we intend, and I think I've been saying it in some of the quarterly calls, we will be putting a big aluminum recycling project in Gujarat over the next few years. And we are doing this very closely with Novellis trying to get the right technology mix right. So. Uh, that is the next place that we will be expanding. I, I think Praveen's talked about the 100 kT of copper recycling that's being put in place, but we are also going to be putting aluminum recycling. So as Hindalco goes into this downstream strategy in India, recycling will be a big part of that. Okay. And lastly, um, on the CAPEX side, uh, in Novelis, you have uh, laid out a very firm plan for 900 uh, you know, million of capex. The total target is 1.5 billion uh, for the next five years. Uh, where can we see the remaining 600 million going? Any any particular segment we should be focusing on? So, Dave, you want to take that, or Steve? Sure, <clears throat> sure, I can take it. Um, though, just to be clear, um, the 1.5 billion um, is our next five years. And yep. the only thing that sits in there is the remainder of what's left from a capital standpoint to spend on the two auto finishing lines, which is not significant, and then the Pinda expansion, and then China, which is 300 million. The remaining uh, part of that, so it's uh, a larger amount than what you had said, uh, yes, is earmarked towards further organic growth. Um, and, and again, these are going to be a variety of projects. Um, I think you should be thinking about recycling and casting capacity uh, as we further uh, uh, support our customers' pull for high recycle content and lowering carbon footprints. I think you'll see uh, further auto finishing expansions down the road. And then a lot of this is smaller de-bottlenecking, uh, continued initiatives on automation, on uh, world-class manufacturing to continue to drive further uh, uh, capacity out of the system, which we've been doing over the last several years. Um, we can't probably get any much more specific than that. Um, I can tell you, as Dev said in his comments, uh, we're excited about the opportunities and we'll do it in a very uh, financially prudent way, uh, but uh, certainly uh, see a lot of market growth and a lot of uh, organic uh, opportunities um, uh, in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Pai, for, for the answer. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Indrajit Agarwal from CLSA. Please accept, accept the prom on your screen and go ahead. So your line is in talk mode. Please go ahead. It seems that we have lost the line. Uh, we will move to the next question. That is from the line of Satyadeep Jain from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. I thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm sorry if this has already been asked. Um, on the capital allocation front, uh, you outlined $1.5 billion in KPEC, growth KPEX and Novelis. Uh, after the debt reduction, uh, there is significant free cash flow that far exceeds the growth capex you outlined. 
So as you achieve your deleveraging targets over the next couple of years, uh, and your use of cash flow is largely going to be um, growth capex from Novelist, or is it? Uh, and can you also talk about uh, what kind of leakage do you have for returning capital to India at, at the Novelist level? Uh, so, so that's the first question. Yeah, I think Praveen, can you take this? Yeah, so really speaking, uh, on the growth capex, uh, Steve has already answered, but to your question about the tax cost, we do not see a very significant tax cost. And that's the point we really wanted to make by saying that we are looking at the overall cash flow uh, of Hindalco consolidated level. And that is why we don't differentiate between uh, the cash flows generated in India uh, versus other list. Um, we, we have earlier also brought in uh, dividends or money from Novelis earlier as well, and that has been demonstrated. So now we look at the uh, company as a whole, and to answer your specific point, we do not see a big tax leakage uh, on this issue as well. Okay. Uh, secondly, on the um, and the growth capex uh, opportunities, uh, you mentioned recycling and casting. Uh, first of all, uh, as we look at uh, uh, the next five years. Uh, is it safe to assume that uh, any uh, foray into extrusions uh, at the novelist level or any hot mill and cold mill expansion outside the China uh, are largely off the table? Any expansion that you're going to see is largely going to be what you've already outlined. And secondly, related to that, uh, I mean, recycling economics uh, uh, look attractive. Uh, and also, uh, casting is something we associate with the upstream also. So can you briefly talk about the potential in those segments in different regions uh, uh, for, for recycling and casting. So Steve, you uh, want to take the, the, the first part and then maybe Dave can talk on recycling. Yeah, sure. So, um, so as it relates to um, uh, expansion again, when we talk about casting, we're talking about sheeting it. So just the, the front end of ours. And, and a lot of times when you couple uh, casting with recycling, it's you want to be in uh, the geographical region of where you're collecting your scrap and then you can put it into your hot mills. Uh, so uh, hopefully that clarifies kind of what we're at least saying about casting. On the extrusion stamp uh, side, um, we think we've got a lot of opportunities on the sheet side uh, to continue to penetrate in the markets we're in. So right now we are not focused um, in uh, trying to find uh, ways to um, introduce new shapes uh, such as extrusions into the Novellus portfolio at this uh, point in time. And then as it relates to um, hot mill uh, expansions, um, certainly you saw in my prepared remarks, we're moving it uh, from 4 million metric tons to 4.5 million metric tons, a significant move over the next five years. Uh, it is um, uh, on the back of uh, uh, the China expansion, uh, which releases capacity at Olson after it integrates with the downstream auto. It's on the deep bottlenecking um, uh, and, and some balancing investments that don't come at a lot of cost. Further hot mill, um, I, I think, is something we'll have to continue to evaluate with our customer base um, over the next three to five years. But there's nothing uh, planned at this point in time. But as we continue to see these markets grow, these will be conversations that we'll have to have with our customers, understand the contracting around them, and, uh, uh, and 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 make decisions, but nothing at this point in time. Thank you. David, the, uh, sorry, sorry. Right. So um, uh, let me talk about the recycling and the economics of capacity expansions on on recycling. So we actually have a very high level of confidence on the attractive economics of expanding uh, into more recycling, and there are a couple of reasons why we feel so. Number one. All the macros on scrap availability are actually highly favorable. Um, as the uh, focus on sustainability keeps going up throughout the world, we see attractive recycling rates, uh, therefore ensuring more scrap availability. For example, in the US, about 700, uh, uh, 700 million tons of uh, the scrap goes into, uh, into landfill. And we will really be able to, um, you know, sort of advocate and uh, actually the, 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 entire, the, the entire system will be, you know, sort of working on advocacy of, uh, of getting more into the system, number one. Number two, uh, uh, 
uh, we also see the auto end of the life uh, cycle starting to help us from the middle of the decade. So as the first generation, for example, of the aluminum intensive vehicles like the F-150 are phased out, it will increase the availability of scrap and particularly high grade auto scrap into the system. So really across the world, the sustainability wave is actually going to make recycling uh, and availability of scrap more attractive. So, so we see a high potential in expanding further on the recycling side. Thank you. Um, Steve, uh, just on the de-bottlenecking, uh, is it possible to share more details on what kind of opportunities do you see in, in de-bottlenecking, where those opportunities are, which regions, which products? Um, listen, uh, I, I would highlight that with the uh, recent um, Alaris acquisition, applying what Novellus has done over the last five to 10 years on what we see uh, as uh, capacity capabilities of our assets, applying it to their system, we do see opportunities um, in uh, in both uh, Koblenz uh, and some of the uh, continuous cast assets uh, in North America. So I think that's one that we'll be focused on. The rest is a number of projects that just continue continues what Novellus has been doing to increase uh, the the system um, uh, and ability to get more out of the system. I mean, we've increased our recovery. Uh, rates on auto by over 10 percentage point, uh, 10 uh, points over the past uh, three to four years. We've increased CAN by four per, uh, percentage points. These all add tremendous amount of capacity to the system, but it's a number of projects. Um, so nothing, uh, nothing big enough to highlight outside of maybe the focus on the new Alaris assets. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next question is the audio question from the line of Abhijit Mitra from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for taking my question. So, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, three questions from my side. First, on 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 the capex that you have sort of chalked out for Nobel is actually, if we look at next five years horizon, there is no new uh, capex that we could see which was, uh, you know, um, not what uh, we were probably expecting in the sense that there's so much tailwind on each of the individual products that we see. So what's the thought process? Do you see sort of, uh, you know, tiring out of this product cycle, something similar to sort of what happened in CAN probably during the time of Novelis acquisitions or, I mean, this product cycles, you're comfortable with uh, them or you, you do see some, some sort of saturation uh, coming in now? For the next few years, uh, which uh, sort of explains this capex decision? What's what's the thought process on this, Steve? Yeah, I mean, uh, we want to be clear. We have not we're not announcing new uh, capex projects today. Uh, we will be in the future announcing new capex projects. The, what we've talked about is the opportunity, uh, and we at Novellus know where these opportunities exist of at least $1.5 billion worth of strategic capital uh, to be spent over the next five years. And that's earmarked already inside of our strategic plan uh, and plans to, to move forward. Uh, again, they're gonna be in the areas that we've talked about, whether it be recycling and casting uh, additional capacity, uh, the China facility, um, de-bottlenecking uh, to continue to drive a, a to the 4.5 million metric tons uh, or above our 2.5 million metric tons of, of recycling capacity uh, to, to continue to drive and capture the market opportunities in front of us. So I, I, I very much hope you did not take away that there's not opportunities at Novellus. We see good growth in uh, our markets um, and, and see uh, very good opportunities and we'll be certainly back in front of you talking about uh, further uh, uh, organic uh, plans for that uh, as and when it makes sense. Sure, great. That's uh, comforting. Second is, uh, um, you know, on the India front, uh, I mean, we have seen, uh, you know, talks of, I mean, you, you did mention about putting up a new copper smelter. <clears throat> now, there were, uh, you know, earlier during the days of uh, Mr. Debu Bhattacharya, and there was a diligence done on the Hindustan copper assets, and the asset is not going anywhere in terms of production. Uh, the mine uh, is there, you know, just sitting to be exploited. So, so what's the thought? I mean, is there any sort of thought which has been given in terms of uh, um, integrating that asset, or at least, you know, look to, you know, um, because because in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sustainability, copper also is coming up as an important, uh, you know, pick. 
uh, in the overall picture so uh, any any thoughts on that so uh, i'll hand it over to praveen but uh, i just wanted to say that i don't think on this call we can comment anything on hcl and the government divestment plans and all that i think that praveen will uh, talk to you about our plans uh, at this stage uh, praveen yeah so uh, as you said hcl is uh, is not on the table at the moment and therefore uh, nothing can be said about it but i can talk about as i said during my presentation about what we plan to do in copper and you saw that the immediate plan is for the recycling part uh, to increase the capacity on the upstream side and on the downstream side as well we have already expanded in the last two three years and we'll continue new to uh, expand in the next five years we don't see a smelter coming up separately but we see that potentially coming up beyond five years so we are not saying no to that but it's a it's probably a question of time uh, so huge opportunities in copper as you rightly said but this is how we we intend to take it forward and i i just wanted to sort of uh, because we are not being inconsistent in the aluminium upstream we have no intention but copper is a converter business with a steadier earning stream and a much better roc and i think with the uh, shutdown of our main competitor india is actually very short right. of copper at this stage and which is why we continue to evaluate but as praveen said the easy step for us to immediately do is a 100 kt expansion using copper scrap which will be uh, also from a sustainability point of view pretty strong so that's what we are going to do in the first step Okay, got it. And lastly, on the ESG front, you know, just to create sort of a benchmark with your global peers, I tried to look through in the presentations, but are you disclosing the target for reducing scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions? And uh, you know, any uh, what what's the investment that is going towards uh, you know those over the next few years? If you can also sort of mention that figure. Yeah, I mean, we we actually uh, are articulating the data in uh, in different ways we talk about it from uh, the specific energy consumption we talk about it from a carbon per ton of aluminium and we are also introducing into this mix the various offsets because you know when we go internationally some people will say i have hydropower so my smelting is you know uh, zero or two tons uh, of co2 per ton and we are introducing it in, into this equation that you have to look at scope one scope two scope three to take your scope one scope two scope three if you take the smelting as scope one then your uh, scope three will include you know the whole transportation of bauxite coming into an alumina refinery that alumina, alumina being transported to your smelter so actually the london metal exchange has actually bought into our argument so if you can see they are now introducing this lme passport that requires all aluminium producers to actually disclose the whole value chain. So we are trying to take this discussion as to a full life cycle of aluminium, what is your carbon footprint? And that's where with Novelis and recycling, we think that you know, we are on a much more better position longer term than someone who says, oh, I have hydropower and hence I am green carbon. So we are saying green carbon is across the whole life, uh, green aluminium, sorry. So we are saying that the green aluminium is across the whole cycle of the aluminium production and also its usage. So this is the approach that we are taking. The LME has bought into it. The International Aluminium Association, of which I am the vice chair, is also progressing down the same. So that's how we are trying to position ourselves. Okay, and uh, the total investment that you see for the initiatives that you have sort of so, laid out? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, every year, so like we have another 50 megawatts of solar coming in and, you know, solar is roughly five crores per megawatt to, to install. So we have got that going on. We have got this uh, uh, hybrid project, which is sort of, we have signed a 20 year uh, power take agreement. So the CapEx is not from our side. So we are doing a number of initiatives, some of it, which we put CapEx, but some of which we just sign an agreement to take the power over 20 years so the capex is put by the others so it's a mixture of both okay got it thanks that's all from my side yeah thank you thank you the next question is from the line of indrajit agarwal from clsa please go ahead 
Indrajit, the line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Indrajit. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks a lot for the detailed presentation highlighting the different aspects. I have three questions. First, uh, can you shed some light on the competitive scenario of the FRP and extrusion products in India, particularly from the import perspective? So what are the kind of imports uh, are there and what are the restrictions on imports are there in these products? Okay, let me take that. So the competitors in India are, there are, first of all, there's no large competitor in FRP, and there's one large competitor in extrusions, which is Jindal extrusions. But largely, the downstream market besides us is a lot of very small players. And hence, the, the product quality and the levels that have been delivered to the Indian market have also been sort of, I would call the mid to lower tier. Large part of the higher tier offerings were coming from an imported point of view. So largely China, ASEAN countries, and some amount from Europe. Now we have done, as we had mapped our downstream strategy, we had looked at all these imports that are happening, as well as tried to look at the growth in those end sectors. And hence we came up with our expansion plans of which products we are going to do. So today, uh, the FRP and the extrusion markets in India are a great opportunity for us because as the country is developing, the need for higher end FRP and extrusions is improving. There is not real capability in India to do that higher end. And that positions Hindalco along with the technical backup and knowledge of Novellis to actually capitalize on that. So that's the reason why I think I've been saying for the last two years and now uh, we are really actually down that road to expand into FRP and extrusions in India. The government, by the way, is taking a lot of imports from China and ASEAN countries. So there is, as you know, on some products from Malaysia, there is an anti-dumping investigation on FRP from China. So a lot of those efforts, because the government really wants to cut down imports under its Atmanirbhar program. I'll give you one specific example, in fact, of air conditioners, which I think uh, Praveen actually touched. We actually worked with the, the government people and the air conditioner industry because the government wants air conditioners to be made in India. And then the, the aluminum fin and the copper tubes also to be made in India. So actually, Hindalco is going to be investing about two to 400 crores over the next three years to actually make that aluminum and copper that is needed for the air conditioners in India so that we can get fully uh, indigenized in that air conditioning uh, chain. Actually, that was my second question. So any of our projects qualify under the PLI scheme or any, uh, any kind of government incentive scheme? Sure. Sorry, I didn't get the answer. The air conditioner project qualifies under the uh, PLI scheme that the government has announced. Sure. Uh, my last question is, in each of the projects, particularly in India, what is the kind of hurdle rate uh, you are factoring in or uh, what is the kind of hurdle rate or IRR we are looking at? Raveen. Yeah, so typically, uh, I mean, we don't give out the number of uh, the, the value of the return. But it is well above the cost of capital. And that's why when I was answering an earlier question, uh, somebody had asked whether the expansion of ROE is going to take place. And the, I quite uh, clearly elaborated on that. That you know, The fact that these are modular investments, they build on the strength of uh, the existing infrastructure and the adjacencies that we have. You can see that none of these investments are completely out of the blue. And they all link up to our existing strengths. Whether it is the technical strengths or whether it is the market strengths, it's all linked to that. So you can be rest assured that this will all, all add up to expansion of ROE and ROCE uh, going forward. But no project below the cost of uh, capital to Hindalco, which is around 11.5%, 11%, they will be substantially higher than that. Uh, a couple of years back, you had mentioned that. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Agarwal, request you to please repeat your question. Is there some disturbance from your line? 
sure uh, so one last question if i may uh, uh, i remember in a couple of years back you highlighted uh, downstream capacities going up from 300 to 600 kt and ebitda going up from 50 dollars to 150 dollars per ton so that uh, for that we uh, our total investment is roughly about 650 uh, million dollars is that understanding correct uh, 650 no I, I i think that if i remember right what i had said we will do 300 to 600 and we'll be roughly spending about 6000 crores over the next 5 years is what i had said i think that from that 2 years point of view we are now starting to give very specific projects that you have seen uh, detailed out there and uh, to, to to steve's point uh, each of these projects as we sort of uh, get the details, do the scoping, do the initial project. We know the exact capex. Then we will announce it. So we have now, what we have done from a capital allocation framework is allocated the amounts of money that we are going to spend over there. And those projects are going through our internal cycle of uh, what we call capital approvals, uh, board approvals, and then we'll be communicating them externally. Sure. Thank you so much. That's all from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vineet Malu from Pilla Sun Life AMC. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good evening and good morning. Uh, so my question is regarding ESG. So you outlined quite a bit of work for yourselves uh, in this initiative and to keep in sync with times. Just wanted to understand uh, this uh, ESG related capex that we are going to spend. And some will come in from the contracts of the external parties. So whatever we spend, is it part of the maintenance capex of uh, overall $450 million or the give outline? Or is uh, it uh, over and above that? So beneath, uh, there is a certain amount of capex that we have to put, as you know, for SOX, NOX, PMI. That we have included in maintenance capex. So which is the FDDs, the NOX reduction, the ESPs, those are under maintenance. The renewable power, uh, all the gas projects, uh, the hybrid uh, with uh, pumped hydro that we are talking to some people, those are not in that capex. And we largely think those we will do with the partner. I mean, uh, to give you an idea, we don't intend to go captive on renewable power completely. We think that you know we are going to connect most of our plants to the national grid. And we will be working with partners because on renewable power, whether it's uh, solar, whether it is hydro, you need scale. So we can put 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts in Aditya and Mahan. But to actually get towards net zero carbon, we have to up that game quite a lot. So there we are going to work with external okay. people. Okay, understood. So my next to this, so some of these projects are actually going to add to your profits, right? Like uses of renewables, uh, reduction in specific power consumption, etc. And some might involve uh, a bit of a higher cost, right? Uh, like removal of waste, etc. Uh, zero liquid discharge and all those things. Uh, so uh, is there an assessment of, you know, what is the net effect on our profitability, uh, you know, as a result of these initiatives uh, that we can understand over a period of time? So, look, uh, there are some projects where we don't go and look at the IRR, to be very honest. If I have to look at zero water discharge, if I have to take a look at the red mud that we are sending to the cement plant, uh, beneath actually to put it in our tailings dam, uh, it's cheaper. But it's just going to be acceptable going forward. So, what we are trying to do on one hand is you have, I mean, going green is not going to come for free. I we completely uh, accept that. Yeah, I agree. It's a must so understand yeah. that, you know, what is the net effect, that's all. But I think that, you know, with that, many of the things that we are doing from an efficiency point of view is actually going to help to keep our cost under control. So uh, we look at, you know, we have already in the last two years put so much solar, most of 11 of my plants are ZLD. But if you look at my cost of production for aluminium, we have held it in the first quarter. So that is the balance that we will be internally doing. We so, intend to keep all our aluminium 
production in the first quartile. And I think that the challenge for us is, of yeah. course, Hiraku, which is right now the most uh, expensive. But there we are getting in quite a few projects to bring that specific energy consumption down. Okay. So my last question is on uh, the capital allocation part and the clarification. So, you know, honestly, it seems currently you're you're running ahead of uh, uh, you know of the targets that you've outlined for deleveraging. And I know it's a volatile world. You know, anything could happen to any sector or to you know any, any part of the business. But assuming that you overshoot your cash flows or undershoot your cash flows, then how do these buckets change? Right. It, it, uh, it, it's not really possible that your growth uh, capex would expand to fill the available resources or reduce to you know fill the less available resources, right? So how do we allocate you know between uh, the balance of uh, balance of stuff? If you if you're doing much better than expected, then would high proportion go to shareholders? Uh, you know, I know you outline percentages, but I, uh, it's not something as clear to me right now because uh, your growth capex cannot it might have flex, but it cannot have too much of flex, right? Yeah. Okay, Steve. I, uh, Praveen, I can see you're uh, ready with. No, no. <laughs> I'm failing to give this answer. You see, uh, Vinit, uh, at the end of the day, the capital allocation framework, as we call it, is a dynamic framework. You would agree with that. There's nothing cast in stone in terms of a number, or even in terms of a percentage. These are more directional. Now, the business situations evolve. The financial markets evolve. There are financings available, there are investment opportunities available. Our intention is not to freeze a particular uh, uh, you know, roadmap in concrete today that this is all that we'll do, this is, all, this is nothing that we not, don't do. So what we, are, what we are outlining is the broad areas and the broad direction in which we are going to go. Now that 50%, maybe 40%, 60% in a particular year is not a guarantee. Uh, we are telling you a five-year story the way we look at it today maybe one year later two years later things are a little different we'll come back to you and we'll explain to you if there's a change in the thinking and if the numbers are changing we'll come back to you and explain to you what we are doing what new things are coming up and why we are doing it so take it in that spirit i would say and uh, that's how we look at it but we want to be mindful the fact that we have these three pillars they actually indicate or signify the three broad priorities that we have growth because we want to make sure that the business grows, the EBITDA and the EPS and the ROE actually grow up. So we cannot ignore it. De-risking because, uh, deleveraging because we don't want to put the company at risk. We don't want to uh, burden the company with a load of debt in order to uh, you know, grow uh, something like you know, at an exorbitant kind of a rate. So we have that other parameter. And third, which is the most critical, is the shareholders return. We want our shareholders to be happy both from dividend point of view as well as capital appreciation point of view, which will also come from the first two. 